Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, thank you for hanging in. Um, we are excited to have Dr. Kreshi with us, so um, you will get to hear him soon. He, he, he looks ready. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Turner. Um, I graduated from Case in uh, 1996 um, and then went on to do an AEGD program at uh, SUNY at Buffalo and uh, completed that in 1997. Um, then I went on and did an associateship and from there uh, bought my own practice in 2001 and uh, have uh, practiced at my own office for, for for, for that time. Um, this uh, International Speakers Bureau, I mean, we started that uh, a while back uh, to help uh, alumni um, connect and, and reconnect to our dental school. Um, you know, we have quite a few uh, alumni here in, in Toronto and, and the greater Toronto area and in Canada. So we just, uh, you know, began this program and wanted to, um, you know, get everyone involved and, and reconnect. And, and you know, um, this is sort of the uh, um, end result uh, from today, uh, as you can see today. Um, you know, we're in a different time, obviously, with the pandemic and normally we do uh, hold um, this session um, typically in September, October, um, and you know it's hands-on and, and lecture. So you know this is a different format, um, and hopefully you'll you'll enjoy this format. Um, so um, for today, um, anyone who wishes to uh, receive continuing. Um, uh, education credit uh, for today for attending tonight's program. Um, you'll see a link um, to a survey um, at the end of the program. And uh, to receive your certificate, please, um, you know, complete that link uh, and the survey. And you should receive your uh, CE certificate about 30 days after completing the survey. Um, also, we, we will take, uh, I think Dr. Kreshi, hopefully you'll take some questions at the end of the presentation. And um, so what you can do is you can just add it, uh, add your questions to the uh, chat box um, that you see um, uh, on your, on your um, link there. So without further ado, um, I'm excited to have alumnus Dr. Fazal Kreshi presenting to us this evening. Um, he's a native of Toronto, Canada, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Kreshi is a board certified oral and maxillofacial facial surgeon and a board certified facial cosmetic surgeon. After graduating from dental school from um, SUNY, uh, School of Dental Medi Medicine with a DDS in 1994, um, he went on and completed a specialty training residency in oral and maxillofacial surgery at Case Western with an integrated medical school curriculum, whereby he earned his medical degree in 1997 and his certificate in oral and maxillofacial surgery in 1999. He is currently a full professor with tenure at and the residency program director of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Case Western Reserve University School of Dental Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he has both academic and private practice locations where he practices full scope of oral surgery. And he and his wife, uh, Dr. Usman, who's an endodontist, um, own their own their practice, the Visage Surgical Institute and V-Spa in Medina, Ohio. They have four beautiful children. Uh, Dr. Kreshi enjoys golf and supporting the Cleveland professional sports team. So thank you again for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And um, uh, again, I apologize for the delay. Obviously I'm still in scrubs and and I had to, uh, we got delayed today um, for my case, but uh, and I appreciate those who were patient enough to hang on. And I hope those who did jump off will rejoin the call. So uh, without further ado, um, you know, this would have been a in-person seminar. I was looking forward to coming visiting home. Um, and I, you know, my, my parents and my, my brother and brother-in-law and in-laws all live in, in Toronto. And that would have been a good opportunity to come home and visit, but such as life with the pandemic. And I hope that everyone just stays uh, safe and healthy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And 
We'll uh, get started in just a little bit. Uh, when asked about uh, topics, you know, uh, Dr. Turner and I had uh, had discussed, well, what would be a good topic for the International Speakers Bureau? And um, this came into mind. And of course, he, he talked about all my other additional scope of practice and training, you know, in cosmetic, facial reconstruction, uh, orthodontic surgery, et cetera. But I think this would, this would appeal to more of the audience in terms of uh, what, uh, what people are doing on da daily. Uh, full arch dental rehabilitation or uh, reconstruction and solutions is something that I do a lot of here at the university with residents and in my private practice, as he said. So that's gonna be the focus of the discussion tonight. And um, I know that I'm, uh, I could want to, is there uh, possible to see the questions come through? Are they allowed to ask questions by raising hands? And how would the question and answer session be uh, we can do that at the end of the course, or if people have questions during my talk, I'm happy to answer them as I see them. So um, maybe Sarah can help. How, how, how will you manage that, Sarah? Uh, we're going to gather up the questions, and then at the end, um, Dr. Turner will check in with you with the different questions, just to be sure we've got enough time to go through them. Perfect. And I think, I, you know, according to the agenda, I think we've got about an hour and a half or so of uh, mm -hmm. talk time and lots of lots of stuff to share with you. And uh, hopefully we can go through all that and then uh, just uh, uh, we'll hopefully wrap things up around eight o'clock and um, maybe leave it for questions until about 830 or 820 to 830. Then. So that sounds like a plan. OK, great. So um, obviously, what you're seeing in the in the in the slides now is uh, all the institutions that our residents uh, rotate through uh, in our program. Uh, let me just uh, go back. So uh, the what the center slide, and you may have seen pictures already, is our new dental clinic. Um, this is from the patient entrance side. This is the HEC on the uh, lower left area. Rainbow Babies Hospital, uh, University uh, Cleveland Medical Center. Uh, the VA hospital and Metro Health. And these are the different sites that our current residents rotate. And Dr. Bauer is the chair of our program. And we have uh, three to four residents per year uh, in our five-year integrated medical curriculum. I've been program director since 2002 and I've been uh, really fortunate to attract the youngest and brightest from around the country. And uh, currently we're thinking about expanding our program to international, um, international uh, dental grads to go back to their uh, uh, home, home country to hopefully uh, push the envelope and pursue uh, oral maxillofacial surgery there. Uh, our current faculty uh, here at the university is, like I said, Dr. Bauer, our chair, and we've got a great group of uh, part-time faculty members, Dr. Heckel, Schneider, Hellman, Lewis, and Tomsick, who help us uh, with the residence education training, with the dental education as well, um, and the very, very vital to the success of our department and program. Um, as I mentioned, I share my practice with my wife in, in private. This is in Medina, Ohio, which is about 35 uh, miles, 40 miles south of Cleveland proper. Um, and it's the Visage Surgical Institute where I do a lot of traditional oral surgery, probably about 70% of it and 30% is dedicated to my aesthetics practice. And we have a spa and, and a couple of estheticians that help us manage that. So going into our topic of um, full arch solutions and uh, basically, uh, full art rehabilitation. You know, this is uh, uh, the uh, patient that we're going to discuss, and we'll kind of go through, um, you know, this scenario. And there'll be a lot of different cases and different options for patients. So, again, she comes in and wants to replace her bad teeth, and she's a 38 year old female um, who has been referred for extraction of all remaining maxillary teeth um, and then some lower teeth as well. And by virtue of her clinical examination, she's, you know, relatively young, middle, uh, in, in her middle ages, um, and, uh, you know, a, an attractive woman. But because of, of her uh, failing dentition, these are some profile views. Uh, here are some intraoral views as well. And you can see she's had some future rehabilitation. Some people might say, well, geez, look, everything looks quite good. The periodontium looks healthy. She doesn't have any, any significant disease. But when you look into her, her panorex, you can see that every tooth has been treated uh, anodontically. There has been recurrent decay underneath all these restorations. And really to salvage um, teeth like this, uh, I think would be 
very difficult and very expensive to, uh, to offer. And she also, uh, which I didn't mention, she has an underlying hemophiliac condition, uh, blood dyscrasia disorder, um, that also puts her at a little bit of risk when it comes to uh, any sort of invasive procedure. So with that in mind, I'll just kind of keep this case in your mind. Let's talk about what happens when we take out teeth when we're talking about full art solutions. Well, somebody like that has her teeth, has good bone levels. And if we were to extract her teeth, well, she would be uh, in a category of when we did extractions um, with very minimal bone loss, she would have be in sort of this, uh, this patient's classification on the far left side. And then from an uh, anterior posterior uh, aspect, front and back, you know, you don't have a lot of alveolus missing. She has pretty, pretty good soft tissue uh, support because of her alveolus, because of the um, minimal bone loss as well. But if, if you were to have long standing resorption as you go from right to left, or sorry, uh, left to right in this case, um, you'll see that the um, space that needs to be replaced becomes greater and greater. And then there's less obviously less alveolar bone uh, to be able to place implants in those areas. So you'll also notice that they become also pseudoskeletal class three because of the maxillary resorption. We all know the maxilla resorbs upward and then backwards uh, relative to the, to the mandible. And so that's really the, gonna be the challenge in cases that are patients that are long-standing tooth loss versus those who become edentulous because we edentulate them and then give them a solution uh, early on. So some options for patients with when you have minimal bone loss could be a fixed solution um, or with long-standing tooth loss as we go again uh, to the right side could be something like a hybrid solution um, where you're actually replacing not just the dental structures but also the alveolar or gingival structures that is that gap in between the dental arches. So as you have increase of interarch distance from gingiva or crest of bone to the opposing occlusion or the incisal edge of your planned prosthetic, then you would have to have a prosthetic that's gonna be designed to fill in those gaps. If you look from the profile view, the greater the pink in the prosthetic, the more lip support we're going to uh, achieve for a patient with somebody with long-standing tooth loss. So keep this in the back of your mind as we're looking at the different options for patients. So in the terminal dentition, when we extract their teeth, what are, our, what are the options? Well, we can go to something removable or something fixed. And I think that's really the uh, dichotomy when it comes to treatment planning our patients and what solution is best for them. I think they have to have a good understanding of what is being replaced and the timing. And um, that really plays a role into the solutions that we can offer. And then of course, there's a financial uh, burden or consideration that adds another layer or variability into the treatment plan. So for you can go from a complete uh, full denture case, you can go to something removable, but th that's like a denture, but can be uh, uh, supported on implants. So it, it would be an implant supported, tissue supported, removable option. And then in the fixed solutions, obviously hybrid solutions are an option and you can go with traditional uh, complete fix with no tissue support um, with fixed crown and bridge. Now, incidentally, the hybrid option is a total implant born solution and therefore um, is, I think, a, a good option also when it comes to looking at what is being replaced uh, in terms of both teeth and uh, hard tissues as well. So what are, what are the pros and cons, you know, doing a complete denture? We obviously know that uh, a, a pro is obviously the finances, um, you know, in terms of cost, right? So, and you can deliver the dentures the same day. We all know though, that there is changes in the alveolus, there's alveoloplasty that needs to be performed. Um, there may be reline appointments, and then there may be a final, uh, comp a final more definitive prosthetic that has to be made. And to me, that's the con because that increases a cost um, and a little bit of a delay. Frankly, uh, you know, these patients require multiple and frequent relining uh, relining appointments uh, where a definitive prosthetic is then refabricated after eight weeks of healing um, from the from the initial extraction procedure. Um, you do get good lip support because of a flange, so that's that's important, and especially in cases where you have moderate amount of bone loss and why you know maybe there's a severe periodontal 
uh, condition. That's why the patient has um, would require frequent relines. But then with, with the amount of bone loss, they would have greater lip support. Um, and you know, I, I think that would help them from an aesthetic and profile view. Um, a con, um, it is difficult to go from dentate to completely edentulous and wear this denture. I think a lot of us in the audience don't have a denture possibly and don't know what it feels like to have something so large um, occupying that oral cavity, that space, that space that your tongue needs to fit into, the adjustment, and then also full palatal coverage and how that affects the ability to enjoy food and the taste uh, functions that uh, get uh, that change. So I think a lot of those are kind of uh, rolled into patient acceptance factors of why maybe patients don't appreciate uh, going, going to a full complete uh, prosthetic. Um, maintenance and mastication, we all know that after tooth loss and uh, wearing dentures that the masticatory forces change and then patients will complain of not just movement and lack of retention because we are using the existing alveolus, gingiva, soft tissue to support. But of course, in the lower arch, we've got the muscle movement of the muscle, uh, of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the location of the mylohyoid ridge. And as the floor of the mouth elevates, these dentures just pop out posteriorly. Um, so these are the obviously the different drawbacks and, uh, of, and we have all treated patients with dentures. So we can go into something a little bit more sophisticated like an implant supported, soft tissue supported prosthetic which does require the use of the tuberosities for support. And we can use four implants in the maxillary arch. So I think this is a nice sort of alternative. It is a removable alternative, um, relatively uh, inexpensive, but you know, some would say, well, the cost of locators, maybe that has reduced our fee. We used to do a lot of bar on implants as a, bar on a prosthetic uh, to, to retain the prosthesis. The bar used to uh, increase the cost to something that, uh, that, that became prohibitive. So locators and zest anchors and so forth came out in the market space um, that allowed us to offer a more simplified solution. And then even talking to prosthodontists, which I'm not obviously, but in working with a lot of specialists in prosthetics that we can even get away with three implants in a tripod format to give someone a removable implant and tissue supported uh, prosthetic. Um, in this regards, we are considering this a minimal surgery in terms of the amount of, of bone reduction and so forth that can be done in the immediate uh, sense, but cannot be loaded immediately. Uh, the implants need to be more in an axial parallel placement. So that's, that's critical. And, and therefore you really want to increase an anterior posterior spread for the greater retention and the long-term success for the denture. Uh, for the prosthetic. The con is the, um, you know, the bulk of the prosthetic that uh, typically, again, can be minimized. In this case, this, this example design, we have a horseshoe palatless upper uh, maxillary prosthesis, uh, which is quite nice. You can see the metal substructure for uh, strength and rigidity, but it is acrylic based. And we, I have not seen a removable prosthetic in this type of design to be anything but more than uh, an acrylic bar or an acrylic uh, overdenture, uh, you know, uh, material. Um, maintenance can be a little bit of an issue because they do have to clean it. There is an intaglio surface and the denture does act like a tray. So it is not an ovate design on the intaglio side. So the flanges do have space where food can come up underneath the flange. And so frequent rinsing, cleaning and washing needs to be done. If, it is, if we are doing a locator, type of uh, design that we all know that the locators need to be re replaced maybe every year and so forth. Um, we do need to uh, be mindful in the workup and the planning of the inner arch space. And a lot of these patients that have been possibly edentulated uh, for many years prior, um, you know, the video changes. And so therefore we need to, to work them up like we do for regular, uh, regular um, removable pros cases with the amount of VDO and uh, lip position, tooth position, et cetera, that, um, that will help us in, in the, the prosthetic design. We all know that without, the, the, uh, without paying attention to these parameters, we can have failure in not the implants, but more in the prosthetic failure. So that's, that's critical in all this. 
Um, just to, as a reminder to all of us and all of you, I think the majority of people, I, uh, I believe, that are on this uh, do practice uh, general uh, dentistry. Um, some pros, and if there's some specialists, they are, know this as well, periodontists, et cetera, that we know that the amount of space required for the locator, um, as well as the eventual prosthesis, as you can see here, um, would be, oops, I'm sorry, let's go back. Um, uh, would be a total of about, uh, with, you know, about 11 millimeters of requirement between the top of the crest of the implant to the um, top of the prosthetic. So I think that is an important uh, value or variable to measure, um, especially in cases where we're edentulating them and there's very minimal bone loss. This is where it's required to actually have a surgical guide that can help us to plan the amount of bone reduction that's needed to avoid prosthetic failure that is fracture of your prosthetic. Um, and then also the placement of the implant, if you have, uh, you know, by chance, this has been a free-handed case that's also gonna compromise the final results. So having it guided as much as we can with the use of CT scans, use of guided technologies can help us to avoid these pitfalls in the prosthetic design. Implants will integrate, you'll have prosthetic failure where the material is rather thin in the areas where uh, you only ha you can't have multi-unit abutments that have angulations on, on locators. They tend not to work very well long-term. And in the case of locators, you can see that the structure of the prosthetic with a metal substructure and framework can give it strength and rigidity. We do know that it, it is still uh, acrylic uh, and uh, cured to the resin cured to teeth. Um, and that, that we know that definitely can snap up. But now we have full PMMA type of prosthesis that uh, can be monolithic and uh, one piece essentially made to look like separate teeth and gingiva but in one piece and you then avoid the, avoid the pitfalls of prosthetic teeth uh, breaking off of a removable prosthesis. So those are the sort of the new, um, uh, newest technologies and newest materials that have been used uh, for a lot of our patients is one piece. So in terms of implant only um, uh, supported prosthetics and not relying on tissue, well, then we need to make sure that if we're just gonna have implant born and not have the, uh, use of soft tissue, we may have to place the implants a little bit more posterior. Well, what happens in the premolar, bicuspid, and molar areas, we have the presence of sinus, uh, the sinus um, architecture and the sinus anatomy, which may preclude us to placing implants without sinus augmentation and sinus lifting surgeries. That might also not be allowed to uh, be done at the same time as extractions or placements may have to be second stage, which then requires additional healing time. Bone grafting, depending on the size of the augmentation, may, may be simple as you know one, two, or two teeth sites. But if you have a full pneumatized sinus from a, a patient that has long-term uh, resorption and long-term uh, edentalism, might require more than just uh, you know allograft materials, more uh, like autogenous grafting, which requires a hospital type of procedure where we actually take uh, bone from the iliac crest or some other autogenous uh, site to get greater volume for a sinus lift. So those are the factors that might play a role into uh, you know, what kind of bone materials and bone, uh, bone replacement options we have. Um, and, that, and therefore the AP spread, if we want the implants to be further posterior, we're definitely gonna run into the anatomical spaces of the sinus we, in, in implant supported, we want them axially placed implants. Um, again, in the removable design, they have to be axial because the draw of the prosthetic needs to be all parallel to each other. If you have implants that are angled in a removable scenario, well, now you have implants that are angulated in the bone and your draw is not parallel to the axis of the implant. And therefore, there's a lot of stress and strain on the implants, both on the mesial and distal aspects. And that's why we end up getting implant failure. And it's really not recommended for locators to be placed on tilted implant design. When we talk about tilted implants, that's why all those prosthetic designs are fixed hybrid or fixed situations um, that the patient doesn't have to remove and you avoid those tension and uh, tensile and sort of compression uh, forces on the implants. 
Um, other, uh, you know, advantages, again, the emergence of the palate, as we talked about uh, in terms of the prosthetic material and the strength, but, you know, we're talking about cost as really as a factor that drives patients towards this option. Um, and if you think about all your patients that you have that you offer fixed versus removable, and it really comes down to cost, but you know, I have to argue that when I talk to my restorative colleagues here, that if you did a bar over uh, a bar prosthetic, or sorry, uh, implant supported on a bar, uh, prosthetic support on a bar, that it becomes just as costly as a fixed solution. So I think these are the things to, uh, to consider. Um, again, as we're talking about bar, um, you know, really, uh, you know, for me, a bar situation would be if someone has compromised uh, at bone structure, we may be able to get the implants in, but I know that this may be a little bit more of a long-term, uh, long-standing resorption problem. The implants need to have some cross arch stabilization. So forces are dissipated, not on the implant, but across across the bar design. The locators, as you see in this example, can be placed at the implant site or in between the implants. So therefore, if this is still removable, when the patient pulls this off, they're pulling it off the bar and not off the implants per se. So that's really the advantage. But again, if you think about the prosthetic space required for all this, you've got the bar height, the abutments on the bar, as well as a locator, that's a lot of space. You're already looking at 15 to 17 millimeters of inter-arch distance. And there you have it, 14 is the minimum by textbooks. But I would argue, I would say that you, if you err on the side of more than less, you, you'll definitely be safe in terms of um, having any, any issue. So the bar thickness is anywhere from four to five millimeters. The locators, we know there's obviously the... Um, the cap that goes on the locator attachment as well. So that's, you know, the scenario for having a uh, sort of locator bar situation. And that, there's the fabrication of the bar, um, again, relative to the tooth position. And that gets, you know, these are all custom custom made. And so that that's why it, it can increase the cost. So looking at so, sort of a two implant scenario, um, this really is for a mandibular arch uh, treatment option. Very rarely prosthodontists, papal, or specialized in prosthetics will, will um, offer two implants on the maxilla. Now, I have done three for some patients, um, and that, you know, and maybe for a patient who has uh, a very, uh, maybe a very small patient in terms of uh, physical framework and physique, uh, very low masticatory forces, and really just, um, you know, and maybe the diet, dietary restrictions on that particular patient might be such that they can only eat uh, soft foods and uh, really want something retentive, but uh, is, is able to remove them. So three implants to me would be the minimum on the maxilla. On the mandible, uh, two implants is typically a scenario that is often used. Um, dental students restore them often in our, in our, in our dental clinic. Um, but you need to have them at least 20 millimeters apart just to get enough anterior posterior spread. Uh, for the implants. We typically like to countersink some of the implants and uh, definitely uh, relieving the denture uh, uh, can be done so the patient can wear her prosthesis while the implants are integrating. So they would not be immediately loaded until after about three months of healing. And in the mandible, we can actually increase that uh, uh, recovery time to two months. So very easy to do on the mandible. This is you know typical scenario, long-standing tooth loss, and you see a very thin keratinized tissue base. And I would also argue that as resorption occurs, your um, your keratinized tissue that surrounds the implant is going to be compromised. We know that we see that you lose hard tissue, you lose soft tissue. So we have to be cognizant of where the keratinized tissue is. So in these kind of the kind of cases, we would not use a punch technique where we want to remove the tissue. We want to split the keratinized tissue, push it buckle lingually away and be able to place our implants in a fashion that has nice keratinized tissue that will heal around it. This is a single sort of single stage placement of implants and in healing caps. Um, you'll notice that, oh, that the space between them is narrow. Why? Because as resorption occurs, the mental foramina become closer together. So we're, we're limited how far posterior we can go based on the mental foramina. Now you can go distal to the mental foramina, the problem is, the crest of bone also resorbs because you have then the saddle ridge deformity that we see 
uh, time and time again. So you can't place your implants uh, in posterior to the foramen, otherwise you're placing them into the canal, even with the short implants. So typically this is a scenario that you don't get a good anterior posterior spread, but you can have something that's a little retentive. You still have flanges in the lingual. You've got the retromolar pads that also help to retain the prosthetic. And when the patient chews, you know, hopefully they don't tip up from the back um, uh, in that scenario. So if you had enough room between the foramen, you could think about placing four implants um, in a, again, removable axial pattern uh, situation. Again, our minimum implant distance to each other, I would not uh, tell you to put them uh, you know, closer than five millimeters. I think you then, it becomes an area for hygiene issues. So five or more millimeters between implants. So if you were to measure the arch length from po posterior implant to the anterior implants, to make sure that we have enough arch length plus the diameter of the implant as well, take into account how much uh, inter-implant spacing we need. Um, for four or more implants, again, we can uh, give them a fixed or a removable solution. Uh, crown and bridge for four implants, I think is very difficult to do. I think you all will agree with that. Um, but people always ask the question, well, can we do crown and bridge on four implants? I think yeah, you, you could do that, but you're not gonna get the posterior, the uh, posterior length if you had opposing teeth at the molar um, uh, molar situation uh, on the upper, the opposing arch, then crown bridge would be very difficult to accomplish with four implants. Um, incidentally, you know, a lot of prosthodontists say, well, how, you know, the arch length or how many teeth per arch can we get and how much can a patient tolerate? There's a couple of factors that I look at in the preoperative selection of how long or what kind of prosthesis we're gonna have. One is their smile. How wide is your smile? How big are the buccal corridors and how wide is the maxilla in terms of the arch shape? So we're looking at not just the bone structure, but you're looking at facially, do they need to fill in prosthetically? How wide can the teeth be? And that's gonna help dictate what kind of prosthetic design you're gonna offer your patient. If someone is very narrow, very small arches and they smile, they have large buccal corridors. Well, either they, they want that, that back to where it is currently, so then that will di dictate the kind of prosthesis or do you want it a little wider and fill it out to help them look a little younger? So these, these are some aesthetic considerations to evaluate your patients prior to extractions and you know, prior to the surgeon getting involved. But this is what I look at when I, when I talk to my colleagues about the kind of design. Here's a, here's a scenario of four implants on the mandible. Again, um, in, if you did a bar, this would be adequate for bar to come across and then you can have locators in between. So you have to have enough space for the bar. If you want to do bar clip scenario or locators, you should have, have to have enough space between the implants. So a clip could be placed um, uh, that would be inserted into the, uh, into the prosthetic. If you did locators, that's what it looks like. And again, uh, we're looking at good soft tissue and healing on this patient. And again, that's what it looks like, you know, on the intaglio surface. And, um, you know, again, patients need to know that these, uh, sort of locator uh, housings would need to be replaced. And there, as we all know, that there are various strengths and pounds associated with those. And you might have a patient with very poor manual dexterity or poor just uh, physical dexterity, physical strength. Rheumatoid arthritic patients uh, come to mind that they have very much, a lot of difficulty in taking these off and often can get very frustrated. So be aware of, of those patients as well. So here's a patient that presents um, actually and you know, she's, she's missing some teeth in the back. You can see where the alveolus contour changes, but you can see a lot of recurrent decay on some of the fixed, uh, fixed units. Here are her natural dentition anteriorly. And again, there are some, there's fixed chronic bridge in the posterior uh, left and there's missing teeth on the right side. Um, this is a patient that we then edentulate, we flap, we deem that the teeth are non-restorable, but you know, as a solution, she wanted a removable option. We take out the teeth, we do an alveoplasty so we can get some sort of level of bone. We've also measured uh, in between the dental arches to give the maximum amount. We can put some healing caps and spacers and some implants with multi-unit abutments to, uh, to help with a, a fixed hybrid situation. And this is a patient that can have a fixed uh, solution uh, on a lower arch that 
is better than a denture that's non-removal on four implants instead of having a locator type scenario. Here's a patient that, again, after being edentulated, wanted something more removable. Again, the extraction sites, alveoplasty performed, placement of four axial implants. And going back, this would be a situation for a removable, situ removable scenario. Again, the posterior implants are dictated by the presence of the mental frame. In a, um, in a case like this, we could do even a sixth implant on the posterior if they wanted to, uh, but I think you can get good retention with four implants. And so from a cost standpoint, which was something that this patient was considering, I think that's a reasonable option. So when people talk about cost in terms of surgery, the surgery to place four axial implants with extractions is the same for me as four tilted implants with extractions. Where the cost uh, elevates is really in the prosthetic design. If someone is getting an acrylic removable on locators, that's a lot cheaper than a fixed hybrid that's an acrylic bar. And so I think the I think from what I understand, the cost can be even double from the different the two different prosthetic designs. That's really where the increased cost factor comes from. The other aspect of the cost is if this patient had severe resorption, the only way to get axial implants would be to do bone grafting. If the, if the bone was reduced vertically, they would need bone grafting to elevate the crest of bone, right, crest of the ridge, weight, and then place implants. Now that cost you know, increases from the surgery side just to get something that's removable. So when I look at all those factors and come out with a solution, I think really have to look at uh, cost factor. We have to look at timing of the procedure in terms of the timing of delivery of the final result. I think those all play a role into why we do a lot more of hybrid type of all on four cases now because of that. And we're not, we're having to avoid, you know, major grafting if we can. The last option for fixed case is like a fixed crown and bridge, um, which would be individual units. So, you know, and this is just an example of a couple of independent units, but for the full arch, I think you're looking at eight implants. Um, I know that, that, and again, this is not a hybrid prosthesis. It is just crown and bridge where you're not replacing gingiva. So therefore we have to make assumptions in these cases that you have ideal bone levels, good periodontal health, and you know, you're really extracting teeth and placing implants in sites that have, uh, have really just non-restorable teeth, not, not from a restorative standpoint, from a heart tissue uh, enamel standpoint, if you will, not from a bone standpoint. So those patients could be offered uh, crown and break. Now we have patients that want to have the feeling of being able to floss in between each tooth. Um, for those patients then you need to you know, do individual impl implants and you know, we're not doing that anymore. Um, but some patients, I know that we can make full arch um, hybrid solutions that they can floss in between the actual uh, crown, but not beyond the pink of the, uh, of the prosthetic. So there are, there are some, uh, some scenarios uh, using, a, um, uh, I know, some other labs, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, that allow us to make individual teeth on a hybrid where it gives the patient the feeling of flossing in between each tooth. Uh, but the the entire gingiva is one piece, so they can't go beyond the cervical, uh, the you know the papilla papillary level of the of the prosthetic design. Here's a case that presents. So this is kind of um, common. Someone with long-standing tooth loss, super eruption of the lower anterior teeth. Therefore, the alveolus is rather high compared to the posterior mandibular alveolus. Let's concentrate on the lower arch for a second, not the upper arch. Oops. The upper arch has severe maxillary resorption. She wears an upper denture. She's satisfied with that for the time being. So for this uh, particular case, she comes in and says, you know, I don't want to wear my partial on the bottom, but I do want something fixed and I don't want to wear, I don't want to have a denture. So uh, what are her options? And for some reason, she was very adamant that she wanted to keep her lower anterior teeth. Now, this, did done, this was done maybe over 15 years ago for me. Today would be a different conversation with a patient, but... Um, so for her, we're looking at uh, surgical options to increase the crest of bone because we know the nerve is very low lying right here. Um, low in terms of it's the 
the crest of the ridge has is low on top of the canal. You can see the mental foramina, just the hints of them, which actually, if when she was wearing her partial, incidentally, that would actually pinch the nerve. And you have a lot of patients that can get a sort of a, a nerve, uh, uh, a uh, dysesthesia, uh, a pain, um, a neuralgia, essentially from every time she chews, she's compressing the nerve, causing nerve injury. So this is an, uh, a photograph of the iliac crest, and that's all the abdominal fat that's pushed aside, the crest of the uh, hip, which you can feel on your, you can feel on your own body. And we take the medial aspect and we can take a nice uh, graft and you can see the cortical blocks that can be added onto the ridge. And you probably are saying, well, this, these screws are right into the nerve canal. Well, actually they're lateral to the canal. So it actually looks like they're skewers, skewering into the bone, but they're actually lateral. But you can see that we try to give her the amount of bone at the level of the anterior region. So eventually she could have implants that could be placed in a crown and bridge type of uh, restoration. And there you have it. And so implants were placed in a guided fashion um, at the level of the crest of the ridge. And um, that's what they looks like intraorally with their healing caps placed at the time of second stage and covering. Again, going back, remember that Bone grafts have to heal four to six months. The implants have to heal three to four months and then final restoration. So now we're thinking about all this additional time and effort, hospitalization for the hip graft. We don't do them in the office. Uh, you need a complete sterile environment for that. And so you're looking at added expense. Sometimes insurance companies will pay for that. Sometimes they will not, depending on the reason for tooth loss. So these are the different considerations that uh, we're faced with on a daily basis challenge. And that's her final prosthetic against an upper denture. Um, and she's maintained her lower teeth and she's been satisfied. And, you know, now I would probably argue that we want to remove the lower teeth. You can see the super eruption. You can't even see she has a significant overjet, overbite deformity because of this, the um, passive eruption of the lower anterior teeth erupting uh, because of lack of occlusion and because of her deep, uh, deep bite as well. So that leads me into a full arch solution. Full arch hybrid solution is really what we uh, do a lot in terms of uh, graftless options. And I like to say the term graftless is because we can tilt the implants in, in areas of where there's minimal bone. So we don't have to actually place implants in, in minimal bone areas, sinus lift areas, areas in the posterior mandible, again, because of resorption, just like in that last case. All companies, and I'm not, uh, um, you know, I'm not, as a disclosure, I should automatically say that I don't speak for any company. I use them all. Um, I'm in a teaching center, so I want to have my residents exposed to the various companies. They'll, they're going to go to different areas in the country, and they may be in a, in, in a, in a demographic which uses just Strawman or BioRisons or Nobel BioCare. So those are the ones we use. What I like about the fixed solution um, First of all, you can do an immediate provisional so they can uh, go to sleep with teeth, they can wake up with teeth. So their own teeth, and then they come wake up with their uh, a second teeth. Um, the full arch solution allows us to, because of materials, we can have a final prosthetic that can be made of zirconia. Zirconia can be extremely uh, thin, uh, uh, streamlined in terms of thickness. So again, from a, a mandibular arch standpoint, uh, less interference uh, with the tongue and soft tissues, um, and and but the you know and of course because they're fixed, patients can actually chew rather normally as what they did with their own dentition. In terms of con, it is expensive for the patients. In terms of overall cost, uh, we do know that um, it is considered minimally invasive surgery because we are not grafting and we're not going to the hospital for this unless there's a sort of a medical um, comorbidity associated with this and can be done really uh, very quickly uh, within two to three hours in the office, same day surgery. So it's rather nice. So let's talk about some full art solutions. The ones you saw, we're all sort of all on four because that's been sort of the, the coin phrase like Kleenex, the brand, but that is a Nobel trademark all on four. Initially, when we first started doing these, we were using still eight implants. And I want to share with you a case of an eight implant hybrid. So you can do them with more. Um, rather, if you have the art space and the patient 
uh, agrees to it. And you might have a compromised patient with bone quality, osteoporosis, you may need more implants. So all in four is sort of the minimum numbers, but it all depends on your patient and your host factors that may dictate more placement of implants. So this patient, you can see that relatively recently dentulated, uh, not by me, uh, comes to me for the implants and wants more of a, of a hybrid um, immediate situation. Uh, we've planned this with uh, old software called Nobel Clinician. Now it's called DTX, but back in the day, we used it. Um, these are actually Nobel Replace implants. Um, and these are the implants coming into the intaglio surface of the prosthetic. This is a dual scan design um, and fully guided uh, technology. So this was then given to the lab. The lab would then actually fabricate the provisional like we do now in the lab. All screw retained is a temporary. We then use a bone foundation guide to actually uh, place the guide in place and fixate it into position. And then we now use the sleeves of the Nobel BioCare trademark to actually prep each osteotomy through the guides and can be done from a flapless protocol. Implants are also placed through the guide. As you see here, guide is removed and very accurate. You can see the amount of keratinized tissue that remains in the facial aspect. Now, if the patient was very thin and had a lot of resorption, I would not consider doing this sort of punch technique. Why? Because you lose soft tissue. Every time you, I, you punch, you'll lose that soft tissue cuff. So if someone had very thin keratinized tissue, I would actually split the keratinized tissue with and push the uh, ridge uh, facially. Uh, this is the prosthetic going in place that day. Adjustments intraoperatively, see under, under sedation. And there you have the immediate provisional in place. You see some of the abutments are not fully seated. We went back after the x-ray confirmed uh, and then reseated the abutments and screwed them in. And that's eight implants. And so, you know, that can be done. And you can see that they're all actually placed. She had enough, uh, enough space from the sinus. So this is that scenario that we talked about earlier when someone is just recently dentulated, minimal bone loss, and you can give them a very thin prosthetic design with very little uh, tissue uh, to build in. As people become uh, long-standing tooth loss, now we got to think about um, the fixed hybrid approach with tilted implants. Again, using a graphless design because we're gonna tilt the implants away from regions that uh, require bone grafting. We don't have to do that. We can angle them. Um, we can use multi-unit abutments that would then angulate, uh, correct the angulation to make them all appear parallel to each other. So that way the access for the restorative uh, colleague is actually, actually a uh, place as opposed to having to lean back and try to approach the screw. So you can see here from this, this simple uh, diagram. Again, we do need the restorative space to be able to have all these components in here. So most lab or labs that work with me will typically design about 15 millimeters to 17 millimeters crest of ridge to the proposed incisal edge of the planned prosthetic to be at least that amount of space uh, to accommodate all the, there's a bar within the prosthesis, the components of the multi-unit abutments, and then of course the, the teeth itself. Um, so you need to have that restorative space. So you, from the restorative end, you've got lab fees that increase the, the cost. Um, from the patient end, it, uh, you, know, you, you go with something fixed. They never have to wear a temporary or provisional. Um, we do have some factors that have to take place in order to be able to accomplish this. And that is the insertional torque value of the implants has to be at a certain amount to allow for uh, this loading to take place. And you do get immediate loading of our prosthetic. So uh, from a cosmetic standpoint, we do get great lip support because you're adding the extra pink on the prosthesis. One critical factor that goes along with restorative space is this transition line. When a patient smiles, it's important to evaluate not only the buccal quarters like I talked about, but how high their lip rises. And so the amount of tooth show and the amount of lip movement, lip mobility is critical in these patients where the bone level needs to be. So taking photographs to aid um, in our lab to be able to create that transition zone, transition line to be apical or hidden above the upper lip is key. 
Same thing with the lower arc. We want to be able to hide. You don't want to have the patient showing lower teeth, lower gingiva. That's unnatural. If the if we didn't have enough bone reduction, then the prosthetic sits higher, and then there's more pink gingiva or pink acrylic showing in the temporary and the final prosthesis, um, which can be uh, again an aesthetic disaster. So critical to be able to evaluate that. Finally, on the lower arch, I think what's important in terms of restorative space is the VDO. The video is critical. We need to have a good measure, an accurate way to measure video in our patients preoperatively, and then decide post-op, is the prosthesis gonna be at the same video or do we need to in, in, increase it? I can tell you patients who have their video increased accidentally, they get a lot of TMJ, TMD symptoms because they've been open and they're not used to having their, their mouth open for that length of time that has to be quickly uh, treated and the prosthesis has to be removed and then either uh, rebuilt as a temporary or just have them go into final uh, with a video correction. So very important to, I didn't put that in my uh, notes here, but I had a patient just today that I had to treat uh, to take off her prosthesis because she couldn't tolerate the increased video that was inadvertently created. So again, in the hybrid uh, uh, sort of hybrid platform, um, I feel that this 14.5 is on the low end in terms of height and most labs will have me remove just a little bit more. Um, and again, taking the aesthetics into consideration where that um, crest of implant needs to be. And this is just the wax up of the acrylic bar within the hybrid. And again, where the tooth forms would be. And again, this, this uh, is no longer done this way. It's all monolithic. Um, uh, can be monolithic or mono, uh, a, a, P, a PMMA, uh, one unit, one piece, uh, which looks very aesthetic in the provisional phase. And you don't have to worry about teeth breaking off and snapping off on, on the area that, that are cured. Um, again, space analysis, you can obviously see I took an example of where there's no bone around this area. Um, and, and again, if you did an axial implant, this would require significant grafting and not even placement at the same time. This patient has very little alveolar bone uh, available to even hold the implant for primary stability. This patient would need second, uh, second stage surgery. Here's the lower arch that shows buccal bone loss. Um, and again, this is uh, you know a situation where grafting is required. So to we can avoid grafting in these patients that have that they can have tilted implants. And so fixed hybrids have been done for years and years. And you see the high success rates enlisted in here. Um, I think they're very good. Uh, you guys can look at these. Dr. Babish was at Cleveland. I actually trained with him uh, when he used to be at Mount Sinai Hospital. If you guys remember uh, back in the days in the 90s, hospital, it, it, they actually closed down in 1999, but he was on staff there. He was a guru on uh, dental implants and we were fortunate to work with him and learn from him. But Paolo Malo really, Malo has, has the greatest literature showing the highest amount of success rate. He's from uh, uh, Lisbon, Portugal um, that have uh, really uh, improved uh, you know, us offering these kinds of uh, surgeries and services to patients. Um, so if you look at the further review, uh, the key uh, in these fixed hybrid cases is the length of the cantilever as well. Um, I think it's important that we, we realize that one and a half tooth cantilever is all that we need, to, we want to go, but we do want to get that AP spread to be about 18 millimeters um, and to minimize your cantilever to nine and a half millimeters. Uh, if we can do that, we have very high success rates. In terms of the immediate, immediate and delayed, we're able to immediately give them the prosthesis, so it's an immediate load, but no chew diet. So that's I think that's important to sort of understand that these patients are getting their implants, but they're not not chewing with them, not functioning with them immediately. Now, some people argue, well, the tongue uh, you know puts function and strain and stress on the prosthetic. True, but they're not allowed to chew. Uh, on the prosthesis, so at least it'll it'll be without any vertical component of stress and strain. Um, increasing the number of implants would be obviously ideal. Uh, this obviously increases the surgical cost. But frankly, you know the way we we do it here, I tend to just give them a bundled fee, one fee for 
four, five, or six implants, frankly. Um, I think that's just uh, doing the right thing. And there's some patients that, that can have six implants, they can only have four. We have to have a minimum of four implants to be able to offer the hybrid situation. So here's a patient, high profile, is a vice president of a local bank in, in my area. That's her smile line. That's her prosthesis in design, or sorry, her, her um, current dental consideration. That's her wearing uh, a, uh, sorry, not that's the upper, uh, uh, the upper uh, occlusal view showing the dentalism and partial dentalism. Here's her x-ray that shows the recurrent decay underneath this fixed crown and bridge. And she basically said, you know, I don't want to put any more money into my teeth. Then I want some options. Now, looking closely, you'll see that there's pretty much uh, a large pneumatization of the bilateral sinus areas. Um, and therefore, giving her the option to, you know, if you wanted six to eight implants and have fixed crown and bridge, then we would have to do grafting or uh, grafting solutions then come back and then place the implant. So she would be in a period um, where she would have just a removable denture as an option, or we can give her a fixed hybrid solution, like an all on four uh, type solution, and we can do both arches that way. So this is back, you know, when we first started doing these in, in a pseudo guided fashion, this is using uh, blue sky technology. Again, no sort of disclosure for me, other than to explain to you that um, these are very similar in, in terms of looking at 3D uh, bone, we can take out the teeth. We can see the recurrent decay. They all sort of snap off here. We flap the ridge and then we start to measure the amount of bone reduction required to fit the prosthesis. So there's just an example of the bone being reduced. By the way, it's an alley, all this bone dust that you see, we sort of autogenously collect that bone and then we can actually mix it up in the slurry and pack those bone, uh, that autogenous bone back in each individual uh, extraction site that we don't implant. Here's the side of the bone that's on um, that's been reduced, and the side that has not been reduced, and just to show you the amount of bone reduction that's required. And you can see that the palatal soft tissue has been reflected, ample, and adequate uh, exposure is critical in these cases. So back in the day of uh, before fully guided solutions, we did some freehand, and I think it's important when I teach my residents that freehand tech, freehand, freehanding the surgeries is key because it, it gives them the, the knowledge base of how guided solutions work. So this is a non-guided case other than the bone reduction. Reduction, excuse me. This template is made by Nobel, and you'll notice that there are vertical lines that are seven millimeters apart. And then at the angle corner to corner measures exactly uh, 30 degrees. Now that's critical because the abutments are 17 degrees and 30 degrees. So having an implant angled in this fashion, that we know that we're gonna be placing an abutment of a 30 degree abutment to make them again parallel. So that, that's kind of nice. So having these markers helps us to make symmetric the placement from left to right and then the posterior implants to be at least symmetric from midline. So we have good AP spread. Um, so we use this intraoperatively in the in surgery. The schematic is such that without guided surgery, we have to know where the anterior wall of the sinus is. So we make a little opening. We can score the bone with a little bone pencil. And then using the guide that that template, place your drill at that 30 degree angle to allow us to you know, be in front of the sinus wall and get full posterior spread of our tilted implants. So there it is in, in surgery. There's your guide in place. There's the opening into the antrum of the maxilla. We can then, you can see the marking in the bone and then placing, this is just a guide pin showing you the angulation of the implant. And so you do the same thing for both sides, place your implants. The key is this. In order to load these the same day, we need 35 newton centimeters of torque value. Therefore, in patients who have osteoporotic bone, D3 or D4 type cortical cancellous bone ratio, we wanna use an implant that has, um, uh, that grabs into the bone, that has good threads. Sorry, I'm just getting a page by one of my residents. Apologize for that. That we wanna be able to load this because of the uh, the stability um, in the bone. So 35 newton centimeters is, is ample stability. 
placement of the implant shows you good torque value. And then you can see that there's the two implants, the anterior one and the posterior one. This just happens to be a little measuring tool. And this is the left side. So you'll notice that the implant is actually subcrestal um, below an extraction site in order to gain and uh, um, get good primary stability. This is what it looks like with all four, whoops, sorry, with all four implants placed back in days of uh, a, a flapless surgery or a, a flap surgery and non-guided, these sinus uh, entry areas will be then grafted uh, and, and collagen membranes will be attached to these areas so that way you don't have full sinus exposure. And then we place our multi-unit abutments and the abutments have these little guide pins that give us a, an idea of, uh, of the axial placement of the implant. Oftentimes I'll ask my restorative colleagues to give me a surgical uh, template of where the prosthesis would be. And we overlay that over top of the guides uh, to then place our temporary copings. Now, back in the days, um, we would then suture around the gingiva we're using these, uh, these little white, white caps, take the white caps off and place these temporary cylinders. Then we would pick up the cylinders in the mouth. So prior to all guided technology and and doing things in the lab as opposed to in, in situ. This is all the old fashioned way. Well, I wanna show you, you know, how we, where we, where we came from basically. The guide, the temporary copings are then cut down and then into proper, into the proper lengths, picked up into the uh, complete upper denture. The lab technician is there chair side. And then we're gonna pick up those temporary copings in the mouth. We don't do this anymore. So all this is now streamlined. This used to be a five, six hour process, uh, full day affair for oh, just a single arch case. But I think it was uh, noteworthy to, to go through these steps. I've been doing this for 14 years now that we don't do this anymore, but having gone through them, we really have a good understanding of what the restorative uh, implications are. The complete upper denture is then picked up in the mouth, taken to the lab, trimmed down. Uh, another wash is done to pick up the intaglio surface. Master cast is then poured up in the lab. Again, this is all done while the patient is, you know, either having a light lunch, they're waking up now. And then the lab technician just takes two or three hours to do the rest of the conversion. And then that's the prosthetic that they get. So, I mean, you get a very nice prosthesis. It just took a long time. And so a patient that enters like this can leave like this. And then two years later, this is what she looks like with excellent healthy tissue. We took off the prosthesis, a little bit of erythema, some food debris. But other than that, the overall gingiva is very, very healthy. Um, and the patient was extremely pleased with her prosthetic outcome. So that's what we came from. Let me tell you what we're doing now to streamline our process. And lots of labs do this, but I use a lab. Again, no disclosure in terms of you know, why I, I'm promoting them. I'm not, but I have really good experience and long-term success within sequence. So in sequence is based out of Nevada. They have, it's a two or three, four week, three or four week lab time in terms of, uh, of making the prosthesis, the provisional. And then my surgical time and delivery could be within one and a half to two hours. So, which is awesome. Great for us, you know, maximum chair side. Um, the a lab technician can be there to help deliver. The restorative dentist can be there as well, or just the lab technician can be there and the restorative dentist can see the patient the next day for a occlusal adjustment. If they've done a lot of these with me, they tend not to come anymore. So we can just handle it ourselves, but it's really one, one location. Patient doesn't have to travel to the dentist's office. Uh, the dentist doesn't have to be there. And it's just an overall ease of uh, sequence. So again, you know, these are just uh, intra, intra oral scanning that we do now. We don't do traditional impressions that this gives us an, a guesstimation of vertical dimension of occlusion uh, using our intraoral scanner. We take a CT scan as everyone knows how to do. This is just a simple uh, care stream unit, but full head needs to be taken uh, with a patient in occlusion and a bite registration. So that captures their video in, and then we can adjust the video if we need to. So taking all that, all the images are then get uploaded into their software. And you'll notice that the the stone cast color is the patient's dentition. The green is the overlay of the planned prosthesis. This is a this is a chance now where we can adjust the patient's occlusal plane. If there's variations of teeth, the patient gets nice teeth. And we try to pick a dental a tooth position, tooth profile, 
similar to the patient's natural dentition. Now, what patients need to realize is that in the provisional, this is rather bulky. And especially in the lower arch, not so much in the upper, but this is where the tongue has to be adapted to. If we, if we make the cut back on the lingual side thin, they're gonna fracture the temporary prosthetic. So I think it's important for them to be aware upfront how thick this is gonna be. And oftentimes I will share, I show them, I'll show a patient what a temporary prosthetic looks like and how thick it can be and what, uh, you know, unfortunately it, it is what it is in order to get them teeth in, in the day that's not going to break. Um, this design has six implants in here. Um, and you can see that there are some implants placed at the most distal site. Here's uh, another plan that shows five implants, some a different variation. But what I'm, what's important to show you is the, the height required and the yellow, sorry, the orange is the bone reduction in the software that will emulate the amount of bone that is gonna be reduced in time of surgery. Um, Another thing to consider is what is the opposing arch and the occlusal plane of the opposing arch? That is a critical factor in these cases. Oftentimes, look at this patient's opposing arch. Look how roller coaster it is. And if you're building a prosthetic to match the upper arch and the upper arch is at level, there's going to be a lot of occlusal adjustments that are going to need to be taken place either on the upper or on the provisional. Now, a lot of times patients don't have the finances to deal with the upper arch or deal with you know, maybe doing some crown and bridge work. So just be prepared uh, for a lot of uh, prosthetic uh, adjustments uh, in these cases. So this happens to be, again, using the in-sequence software, five implants on the lower arch, the amount of bone, just, just some sagittal views just to show you that we evaluate these cases from all aspects. This is an example of an upper arch. And again, the green is the prosthetic design. You can see that we're trying to design this prosthesis that's not going to be too far facial, that we're trying to stay within the confines of the arch form. There is obviously some rotational issues of the patient's natural dentition. So, you know, that, you know, that we take that into account and we show the patient that we're going to have straight teeth and teeth that are not are going to be overlapping. Again, bone, uh, bone resection or bone reduction amount upper arch, a different case, just to show you, again, looking at it from the sagittal view and how we're tilting the posterior implants by the sinus floor. So this is how it comes in a box. So this is called in sequence. They send us the all the planning that's all uh, 3D printed now. It, actually, I can get a bone reduction platform. Uh, the amount of bone that's gonna be reduced, this actually comes off. These teeth come off. So everything is sort of plug and play. So you can actually do a simulation surgery in, in the office. Uh, this is a foundation guide that allows the guides to sit upon. So you have stacking guide system and technology. The foundation guide stays on during the case. The uh, surgical, uh, sort of the drill guide goes on. You see the sleeves that we've seen before. And then there's an abutment guide that allows me to place my angled abutments appropriately. This is the uh, final prosthetic that can go on as well, just to show um, us how it looks like. And all the components are nicely and neatly numbered um, in a little container by tooth numbers. And everything is um, pre-selected by the lab for us. The temporary cylinders are there, the abutments are there. I don't have to order extra parts, extra screws are all contained within each tooth number. So very well organized. This is the big, this is the case that it comes in and you get um, your provisional, obviously. So you can, you can, you get your mounted uh, models. You can ask them whatever articulator that you, that you have. We use a SAM-3, uh, semi-adjustable uh, semi mounted articulator. Uh, and we can, you know, sort of play around with that. And everything that we talked about in terms of guides comes in the kit. So let's go, go through the case real quickly. This happens to be a lower arch case that we're gonna remove and restore with an in-sequence technology. So extractions are done like we normally do. We suture the lingual mucosa out of the way, the floor of the mouth is out of the way. And then we place our struts guide, the, the foundation guide with these struts give us the vertical dimension. So we know that we're not overclosing the patient. We take these big struts off and you see here that the 
Was there a comment at all? One second. So this is the amount of bone that's going to be reduced. We use the platform of the guide to smooth the bone out. And this again, very nice platform, allows us to place now the template or the drill guide over top. And then we do using our drilling sequence, you can see the angle of the posterior implants. The implants can be placed through the guide themselves. And remember, because this is all guided, even the hex rotation is predetermined for us that the hex has to line up with these little markings that are on the guide. And this is all determined by in sequence and by our plan. The abutment guide is then placed and you can see that even the abutment guide has a little line for us to uh, place our prosthetic screw into the implant. And if it's not lined up, then we know that the abutment is not at the proper angulation. Because if we're off, then, it's, then the whole prosthesis is not gonna fit. This is what it looks like when everything is taken off. The foundation guide remains. These bone gaps will be filled in with bone and membrane and tissue. Cylinders get placed. Remember the cylinders are already pre-cut as opposed to be being done in the mouth. These are already pre-cut for us. So not nothing has to be done by the lab technician. The prosthesis fits over top of the cylinders and these gaps are then filled in with resin with the patient in proper occlusion, okay? So everything is already pre-done and that's the patient. Now, you're gonna notice, oh my gosh, the midline is off, there's a occlusal discrepancy. Part of this is that the patient is asleep still and so we're manually holding the patient up. And so it looks like that there is a discrepancy with the midlines um, ever so slightly, but there'll be some adjustment that needs to be done. But for a provisional and with the amount of speed of time, I think it's fantastic. Patients need to know that the soft tissue will continue to remodel and heal over the course of the next two to three months, and they will start to recess. That's okay, there'll be a gap, and sometimes they'll have to be aware that food will get, get in there, but remember they're not, they're not chewing anything. The occlusal uh, access openings are then filled in with the registration material that can be easily plucked out. So this is a case where I felt that the VDO was not, um, was not taken into account. She has too much lower teeth show. And so this is clearly an example of maybe more bone need to be reduced or the initial video, the occlusal measurement was incorrect. And therefore we didn't have her completely uh, measured properly or she may, she was op uh, too open in the time of the, of the, the scans. So um, in terms of mandible, um, we have some new intermediate um, type of designs that I'd like to share with you. It's called the trefoil. Now the trefoil is three implants as a fixed hybrid. And you'll notice that they're axial implants, but where the cost is uh, helps in the building of this prosthetic is this bar. This bar is prefabricated based on the patient's geometry and anatomy of the mandibular arch. So not everybody can be a candidate for this type of implant system. And in fact, how do I know we know that they're a candidate? Well, there are measurements and so forth, but easy, easy enough, the, the Nobel software that this is a proprietary of has this template uh, in the software to allow me to overlay it on the bone to allow it to see if it's in within the confines of the patient's mandibular arch. What's nice about this particular system is that it's fixed hybrid. It's also same day delivery. And not only same day, it's the final delivery within a week. And they don't have to wait three to four months for final. And the reason is because the, the bar is already being fabricated and given to the lab immediately. The disadvantage of this workflow or this option is that the prosthetic design is acrylic only. It cannot be PMMA and it cannot be uh, zirconia. And maybe it could be PMMA, we haven't done that yet, but they've been mostly acrylic on the bar. So that is the only disadvantage. And this is only right now for the maxilla. So, and I'll share that with you in just a little bit. Um, some, uh, some pitfalls and so forth, um, complications, of course, we can, you know, in, in two piece uh, type of situations where you can have fractures of the prosthetic, 
again, sorry about that. Fractures of the prosthetic, uh, acrylic breaking off, et cetera, curing issues. Framework of fracture has been rare. Um, uh, so, you know, and but we, everything needs to be a passive fit in the, um, uh, on the prosthetic and in, in, in the final. So the pickup has to be done appropriately. So back to our case, this was a pa that patient, the very, very first patient that needed implants and needed extractions. And so we offer her the LN4 on top and on the bottom, we're just extraction of uh, single unit teeth and placement of individual units. And this was done in the operating room uh, because of her coagulopathy, uh, burring of the bone, placement of the implants. And there's our case complete with her immediate provisional week later. So very little swelling. And that's uh, her temporary and that, that's not her final. And that's the, the lower lower uh, implants be healing. So uh, really good uh, offering for this patient. What about severe uh, edentalism or atrophic arches? And we've got about uh, 15 minutes left and I'll just wrap things up with some extreme cases. Well, again, we I mean, this patient is very concerned about Obviously, um, I, I iatrogenic mandibular fracture. Um, we only have the anterior mandible. Remember, the symphysis is very good bone, um, and we can do the larger bone grafting options. For the maxilla, we can do the zygomatic uh, uh, implant options, and let me talk about that a little bit. The zygomatic implant is an implant that actually traverses um, through the maxillary sinus. It's placed as po posterior as possible if we can, in the bicuspid uh, molar area, and it engages the maxillary bone just lateral to the orbital rim on both sides. Um, if you tilt this implant a little bit more forward, you would engage this bone, which is a little stronger than, than the schematic, frankly. Um, you see that the sinus is lifted out of the way. It's not, we're actually going intrasinus. So we're going through the sinus and so the implant that's in the, in the sinus, we typically will cover that up uh, with soft tissue like buccal fat. Now, what's important to know is that we can essentially categorize the maxilla into zones based on the, the bone available, anterior, zone two, and zone three posterior, okay? Now, zone three is where the, if you have loss of bone in zone zone three, then you place implants in one and two. If you have loss of bone in zone one, uh, two and three, then we only have zone one to place bone and then maybe a zygomatic implant to get more uh, posterior spread of our prosthetic design. So that thing, that's, that's quite critical. So before zygomatic implants came out, what are our choices? We had to do hard tissue grafting. So, uh, hip grafting, sinus lift surgery, Lafort one osteotomy, like in this case, where we actually cut the maxilla and then because it's so class three, move it into a class one position, horizontal movement. Um, and then you have to wait and then implant and then you have to do uh, soft tissue grafting and vestibuloplasties. Here's a case of severe maxillary resorption. This is her with, uh, without the denture in place. Again, just to imagine that there's no bone there and that, that her denture just holds her lip out. This is the Lafort osteotomy incision design. We take cranial bone graft, PRP and hip, and then mix them all up together. Oops, what happened here? We can create a bone slurry and bone blocks. Bone blocks can be added for buckle augmentation and vertical augmentation, plates and screws to hold the maxilla in position. And that's what it looks like in a better relationship, still not ideal, but still better than what she had. And this is vertical augmentation as well as horizontal. And then placement of, and this is again, another panorexia shows that, 
and then coming back and placing implants into that grafted bone. But now she gets a prosthetic that's not fixed, but is a complete removable upper denture with a palate. So still not the ideal situation. Because now we can use, and this is her without the prosthetic, with the prosthesis in place. But now we can use zygomatic implant. I want to show you a couple of those. So the zygomatic implant engages uh, four cortical bone plates. The part that engages the crest of bone is at the most, at the uh, sort of what we call the coronal portion of the implant. And this is the apical portion. The apical portion will engage the zygomatic buttress and the zygoma. And these can vary in length all the way from 30 to 52.5 millimeters. And you'll notice that these implants can automatically have a 45 degree angulation to them. So that's kind of nice to already have a, an abutment that you don't need to have a multi-unit abutment that's angled. The abutment will be straight, but the implant has an angled head to it. They do make uh, straight implants now. This is another patient example that has severe resorption. You can see the collapse. She also has minimal lower teeth. And so for her, we're gonna offer a zygomatic implant option and an all in four option on the bottom. So that's the 3D version of her edentulism. Some scans to show you the pneumatization of the sinus and what bone we have available in the zygoma, both sides. This is how it's done. We actually create an incision, make a little window in the sinus uh, wall and then use our long implant drills that will actually engage palatal through the sinus and into the body of the zygoma to be able to insert this long implant. And there's the placement of the implant. Now we call it intrasinus, meaning that the sinus wall on the outside protects the implant. On the inside, we might add buccal fat or to cover this area so it doesn't get infected. And there you have the straight abutments, palatal, and the multi unit abutments on the anterior area to at least give this patient four implants for a full arch. And that's what it looks like after it's healed upper and lower, that's a zygoma implant. There's the orbital rim, look, they look short, but it's a panorex orbital rim. And they did quite well. And that's her, the final prosthesis. You'll notice how much acrylic is required for the lingual portion because of the way the angulation of the abutment is, and that's because of the resorption. So more resorption, more sort of palatal flange or palatal aspect of the prosthetic. And there's her prosthesis and occlusion. Finally, for the atrophic mandible, what are our options? If you have severe bone loss, we can do short implants, which I'm not a big fan of, but they need to be wide enough. We can do nerve lateralization. We can do temple technique, which is this example, which implants stick up off the bone. And this is done from an extra oral approach. That's an incision from the chin, lifting the whole chin up over putting the implants onto the crest and then not going through the oral cavity. The mucosa and periosteum is left intact. And so when it comes over top, it'll actually tent up the periosteum and we pack autogenous bone around the implants. And this is what's called interpositional bone grafting, uh, which increases the height of bone and placing cortical struts to hold the bone up in the posterior fashion. So here's an example of a resorbed ridge there's a CT example, a submental incision. We can then drill and place implants in what's called a transmandibular implant fashion. This is not being done anymore. This was done when I was a resident in the 90s. This was actually a very common procedure to allow a patient to get a denture immediately, two or three days later. These are transoral or intraoral uh, screw fixtures that are placed, lots of components and parts. And a pickup was done at the time of placement and a gold bar was created, literally placed into the patient um, within two or three days or a week after surgery. Another case for severe edentulism, again, coming from the extra oral approach and the tent poles that we just talked about. These are the mental foramens on both sides and the implants and the sites that are, are, are drilled into place and allowing bone to fill in around these 
And this is what it looks like on the x-ray after the uh, tissues has been redraped. Skin grafting is done intraorally because you do need some good mucosa, especially with the atrophic mandibles you don't have. And this could be done also at the same time as a vestibuloplasty and pushing away the buccal lingual soft tissue. This is a skin graft. And that's the final prosthesis x-ray. Finally, trefoil, another solution. And we just talked about three implants on the lower arch. Again, using the software specifically, see if I have something that I can show you. So I'm actually scanning through the design. You can see the implants have to be within the confines of the mandible and the actual prosthetic uh, framework is already in the planning software because it's already prefabricated. So this is something that we can, you know, uh, offer the patient as an intermediate vertical dimension. Everything that we use, you, we typically do face wall mounting that we have to take into consideration. This patient usually are either completely dentulous or uh, have failing processes of terminal dentition. We typically can have a surgical alignment guide that can act from, from the duplicate denture that can be placed in the mouth during surgery. These are the various drills and steps and allowing us to place implants in the same fashion and the same spacing as the prefabricated bar. So I'll go through a quick case where this patient's teeth were failing and ailing, terminal dentition. She had an upper all and four done by me about 15 years ago. Finally decided to do something with the lower arch. I believe this is the planning of where the implants need to be and how much bone needs to be reduced. And you can see it really much at the apices of the existing teeth. So lots of bone that needs to be taken down to accommodate the design. The teeth are then, the soft tissue is then exposed. The uh, what we call the foundation guide is then you laid over top of the teeth, pin guide. You can see the platform, teeth will be extracted and then we re remove the bone all the way down to the platform, just like we do normally. This is the trefoil kit, looks rather complex. And in the beginning, it is a special course that we had to take to be able to actually purchase the kit by Nobel. But the vertical dimension has been checked and then the use of the sequence, which I'm not gonna bore you with, we typically place the implants in the fashion of the three implants. Now, what's done now is then the implants are then picked up with the use of what are called these transfer copings and Duralay pattern resin and, and then is then picked up. This is then taken to the lab and a master cast is then uh, formed. The lab tech then takes the, uh, takes the master cast from me or takes the, um, uh, the actual uh, prefabricated bar from me, places it in the patient's mouth, takes an impression. This is sort of the pickup of, the, of a temporary uh, prosthesis and then takes it back to the lab and then fabricates and, and uh, creates the final within one week of surgery. And that's the patient with their final. So you can see the healing after three weeks. So that's what it looks like actually when the implants are, are placed. This is just a different patient with a, another prosthetic, prosthetic design of trefoil. So with that, you know, we've been able to help the thousands of thousands of patients you know, over the last 15, 16 years, both at Case Western and in my private office. Um, I know that, uh, you know that these are, these are offerings that you know, are very helpful uh, to, to you all. Uh, this is my family, my wife um, who practices with me. My son is graduating from medical school this year. My daughter is graduating from dental school and I got the two boys still in high school. And with that, I think it is exactly eight o'clock and I'll stop and answer any questions. And I wanna thank everyone, whoever's on. Um, and I can't tell how many participants are here, but uh, Colwant, I wanna thank you for having me. And I wish I was there in person and engaging, but hopefully one day we'll meet again uh, in person. So again, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for putting this together from our alumni office and for 
being on here for this time and uh, allowing me to be part of the International Speakers Bureau for Case Western Reserve University Alumni Office. So let me see if I can stop sharing here. There we go. All right, Dr. Turner, would you like to uh, ask any of the questions that were sent in? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that uh, fascinating and definitely graphic uh, info. Uh, some of those cases were pretty pretty wild. That the, the stuff with the zygoma, I'm like, wow, you know, 30 to uh, 52.5 millimeters, like that's, you're, you're getting way up there, right? So, wow. Um, so, um, so just a couple questions. Um, I have one here. It says, um, "Do you still place? Do you still place the implants five millimeters apart when you do an all-on eight? So, an all-on eight. In that case, um, it all depends on the prosthetic design. So, to me, if it, if I, I believe with an eight implant. You can go to more traditional crown and bridge in terms of the restorative uh, plan. And so usually with these with, with eight implants like that, I'm working with my lab technician. I'm working with working with the restorative dance. So it's a you know definitely collaborative approach to all these cases. I I, I want to make sure I emphasize that. I can't I can't underestimate the, the, the need for restorative colleagues to be involved in the planning, me as a surgeon and the lab technician. And so De depending on the prosthetic design will di dictate how much space you need. Usually if it's crown and bridge, you're gonna be more than five millimeters. You just don't, you can't put all those eight, eight implants together. Now, um, you know, uh, a case like that, like in my the case that I showed with it, it was actually an all on eight is what it was, but the implants were all actually placed if you remember that case that I showed. So those were more than five millimeters apart, maybe, maybe even, you know, eight to nine millimeters. So, we still like to keep the spacing appropriate. Really, if you're doing implants, just think about single units. We're not putting implants closer than three millimeters in single unit cases. So if you're going to do a bridge of implants, six implants or six teeth, you don't need six implants. You need maybe you know three or four implants to give you six teeth. So you're definitely going to be more than five millimeters apart. Hope that answers that question there. Yeah. And a follow-up to that is, uh, what is the largest angle you have seen that an MUA can correct? So um, I try not to go past 45 degrees. 30 degrees is what the guy, you know, when we try to plan them out with our, again, with our software designers and engineers, you know, um, I don't plan the cases myself. I don't have the time, frankly, and I leave it up to the engineers to do it. But when I teach my residents, if we're doing it freehand, I don't want to be more than 45 degrees. That's too, if you're 60 degrees, you, you don't want to be 60 degrees to the occlusal plane. So 45 degree would be my maximum. The abutments that are angulated, the maximum angulations are 30 degrees. So you can only, you can't go beyond that. So that's, that's our lim rate limiting step. And another question um, says, can you talk about the surgery you did today? And oh, today's surgery, why I was late? <laughs> no, it was, it was, well, the, the one I did today, I, I had the larger surgery that was delayed for was orthopedic surgery. So that was traditional osteotomy case. Uh, the one before that, it was a patient that wasn't a surgery, but she was two months after an all on four. And actually we did five implants in the bottom. We call it all on four, but all on five. Um, her video was uh, poorly, I think, uh, registered in the planning and she developed a prosthetic that was too tall for her. So she was actually open for two months with a lot of strain on her TMJ and having a lot of pain and discomfort, uh, saliva control, um, and just, uh, just in a lot of anguish. So I just removed the prosthesis today. So uh, the, today was not an implant day. It was more of orthodontic <laughs> surgery day today. Um, and a follow-up, uh, for an older patient, 70 plus years, where cost is not an issue, 
do you find they prefer to go with removable or fixed implants? Um, so it's, it's very interesting. I just had a patient yesterday that I treatment plan and it has to be a 75 year old Sjogren's disease, terminal dentition. Um, and if you recall Sjogren's disease, dry mouth, dry eyes, et cetera. And one of the, one of the options that the restorative dentist gave the patient was let's take out the, take out the teeth, put two implants and give her a, a removable prosthetic. I don't know how many patients you've treated, seen with Sjogren's disease. I see a lot just cause we're in the you know, the university setting and in my private practice, those patients do very poorly because of the lack of saliva, obviously the dry mouth with a removable prosthetic that rubs on gingiva. And if it's implant and tissue supported, those patients don't do very well with the removable prosthesis. I try to push those patients towards something fixed. In an older patient, frankly, if they don't have the dexterity to remove the implants, if the locators are not, uh, are too retentive, I would rather go with something fixed that they don't have to worry about. And as a restorative dentist, you don't have to take the prosthesis off every year. We used to think that 12, 15 years ago, that every year the patient has to come back, remove the prosthesis clean. If you can see underneath the prosthesis, if they're cleaning well, water pick, good hygiene, you leave it on, you just leave it on. You don't have to take it off. So I would actually go with a fixed solution for my older patients. Um, one more here. Um, what are your thoughts on placing an implant at a site with no native bone, a hundred percent integrated graft material? Is it good success? Well, that's never the case because there's always native bone. So even in a sinus lift, no matter how much resorbs, the patient will always have a cortical wall of the maxilla. So in lumatized sinuses, there's always going to be some crest of bone, and then it'll be all grafted bone on top of that. If I'm grafting that much, it's usually going to be autogenous graft for me. Some, some surgeons who, you know, if I have somebody with 90% bone loss, I'm using autogenous graft. If I have 50% bone loss, I'm going to use aloe graft and mix it in with something like BMP. Um, but there is never 0% um, 100% bone loss. So there will always be some bone, but the, the, the secondary bone that's recreated or reconstructed for me is going to be autogenous bone, which then is their own bone. So it's always native bone. Hope that answered that question. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. Um, so with that, thank you. Um, you know, we've received some great information from you this e evening. And, you know, on behalf of the School of Dental Medicine and our audience, thank you again for your presentation. Um, your insights have definitely been, you know, thought provoking, that's for sure. Um, so, again, thank you for your time. Um, I, I, like you said, hopefully we will meet uh, when, when you do come back. Um, Absolutely. Or, uh, you know, hopefully this border situation resolves itself. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to remind the audience that, uh, again, just complete the survey if you want to receive your uh, CE credit. Um, and hopefully uh, everyone will join us at a future dental school program. So with that, thank you, everyone. Just, uh, and feel, anyone, feel free to email me if you will. Um, I'll uh, be happy to answer questions. FAQ. It's easy at case study to you.